We're going to find our, our scripture from the book of St. Mark. St. Mark chapter 16. Saints, don't stop praying. The Lord is nigh. Don't stop praying. He'll hear your cry. The Lord has promised. His word is true. Don't stop praying. He'll answer you. Saints, don't stop praying. The Lord is nigh. Don't stop praying. He'll hear your cry. The Lord has promised his word is true. Don't stop praying, he'll answer you. Saints, don't stop praying. The Lord is nigh. Don't stop praying, he'll hear your cry. The Lord has promised his word is true. Don't stop praying. He'll answer you when you're in trouble. The Lord is nigh. When you're in trouble, He'll hear your cry. The Lord has promised His word is true. Don't stop praying. He'll answer you when you're downhearted. The Lord is nigh. When you're downhearted. He'll hear your cry. The Lord has promised His word is true. Don't stop praying. He'll answer you. Saints, don't stop praying. The Lord is nigh. Don't stop praying. He'll hear your cry. The Lord has promised His word is true. Don't stop praying. He'll answer you. Thank you, Lord. Mark 16. Mark 16. I told them that at 8 o'clock uh, in 2002, uh, what I'm about to share with you today, we delivered this message here at the church. And so I was praying last week, asking God what for, for this week. And um, he reminded me of this message. And uh, my response to him was, well, Lord, I, I already preached that once here, and uh, his response back to me was, well, have you sang a song more than once at the church? I said, yes, Lord, I got you. So um, we're going to deliver this again uh, because I believe it's the appropriate season, the appropriate season. Mark chapter 16, verse 1, I'm reading from the King James. If you see somebody beside you that doesn't have a Bible, please be kind enough to share your Bible with them. And when the Sabbath was pa passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, um, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, that's Jesus. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering to the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Verse 7, but go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he go before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him as he said unto you. I'd like to speak for a few minutes uh, on uh, this morning from the thought, go find Peter. Go find Peter. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today 
for your spirit, for your power, your presence that's in this house. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for divine assignments. And I thank you, Lord, for appointed days and appointed seasons. It's amazing to see how your word never spoils, never perishes. And uh, thank you, Father, because uh, in these seasons in our life, we need a word from you. Lord, in, in these times that we live in, we need a word from you. God, as disturbed as our spirit is, we need a word from you. So I pray today, speak clearly that your people might understand it, that they might grow from it. Lord, that they may be propelled forward. May that same word, bless you, reach down into a tomb where Lazarus is, and raise up somebody that fell off in you. May your this same word strengthen legs, God, that have become lame. May this same word, God, stop the funeral of someone who's about to die in you, and may they be raised up to go and do your work. We thank you, Father. Bless you now and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I'd like to talk to you from the, the thought of the idea this morning. Go find Peter. Go find Peter. Romans, the 11th chapter and verse 29 says, For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance repentance. It's interesting to see the reasoning for Paul's writing those very few words. As he lays out those words, it has been uh, upon a dialogue that started in the ninth chapter of Romans and has uh, begun to accumulate uh, over chapter 10 and going into chapter 11. What Paul has done uh, over those uh, three chapters is lay out for us the concept of the Jew and the Gentile in Christ Jesus. He styles the Gentile and says that you are like a wild olive tree that's out in the middle of a wilderness. However, he says about the Jew that they are a olive tree that's in a uh, cultivated olive tree that's in an orchard. The wild olive tree had no one to attend to it, no one to care for it, no one to prune its branches. However, he says that the uh, cultivated olive tree was in an orchard and it had someone to attend to uh, its branches to make sure that there was sufficient amount of water so that the tree would be able to adequately grow uh, and be sufficient to be able to produce uh, great olive berries. <clears throat> what Paul says in writing to this Gentile church, for the church at Rome was largely Gentile, did have some Jewish people in it, he was writing to them and he shares with them that you are, are Gentiles. What God has done for you, he has taken you who were a wild olive shoot out in the middle of nowhere. He has taken you and engrafted you into the tree that's in the orchard. In order to do this, he says, he has amputated or cut off or pruned branches that were on the cultivated tree. He has cut them off and cast them off for a time to bring you in to the orchard so that you might now receive of the promises that God has given unto Israel. However, he turns around and he says to the Gentile, but please don't become arrogant or to think that uh, they were cast off, and now that you are engrafted in, that you are better off than them. He tells them that in casting them off, God has engrafted you in, so that you might be partakers, but God is also using your engrafting in that you might provoke those who've been cast out into jealousy, that they might turn around and serve the true and living God when, once they recognize the glory of God in your life. And he says to them, please also don't become arrogant. Don't become uh, self-righteous. 
do not feel as if you are superior to those who've been cast off. Because if you disobey, the same thing that happened to them will also happen to you. So he, he shares with them that you've been cast, those have been cast off that you can be brought in, but those who were cast off are still a part of God's plan. Which is why he says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Brothers and sisters, there are gifts that God has that are unchangeable. There are assignments, there are ministries, there are giftings, there are anointings that God has given that are unchangeable. And they do not change because God does not change. He is the unchanging God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he tells Malachi to tell the people, Malachi 3 and 6, I, the Lord, change not. So he, he doesn't change, for he is immutable. He is the, the constant God. And he distributes gifts that are unchangeable. If these gifts, please note this, if these gifts are unchangeable and God is unchangeable, the gift that he gives is based on himself. So God will give out gifts that are based on his own character, and this gifting that God gives, he guarantees or endorses the fact that this gifting will come to pass. That this calling that I have given will fulfill its divine assignment. Now, these giftings of God have come from above. James chapter 1 and verse 17 tells us that God's gifts come from the Father above. And that these gifts that come from above, they are perfect, perfect or mature gifts. And that these perfect gifts that are mature uh, are based on his unchangeable character, or he says there is no variance in God. There is no variance in God. There is no shadow of turning in him. So he, he gives divine gifts from above. These divine gifts that he gives from above are based on his own character, and these divine gifts that are from above that are based on his own character, these gifts are mature. Now let's take a journey. Let's go to the book of, of Romans, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. So God gives out gifts, and these gifts that are based on himself are uh, gifts that are in the church or in the body of Christ. Each of you are a gift from God. If you'll just help me reinforce this, tell the person next to you, you are a gift from God. <laughs> now I need you to witness about your own gifting and tell the, uh, somebody else, I am a gift from God. Right. So God has uniquely given gifts and he has placed them in the earth. With these giftings that come from God that he has uh, put in the earth, he tells each of us in Romans 12 that we should all be sober-minded. We should all think clearly, he says. And in thinking clearly, no one should think more of himself than he ought to think. That no one should be conceited when they understand their gifting. No one should be arrogant when they consider their gifting. How so? That it's not you that gave the gift. The gift has come from God. You had nothing to do with this. So there is no need for you to feel conceited or to be arrogant uh, or to boast about your gifting because you didn't provide this gift. God gave this gift and with this gifting he has provided in you. If you'll see this. This word, uh, the gifting from the Greek is charisma. And the, we would say it in, in the English as charisma. But the charisma uh, is the Greek translation of it. It is a special ability or a special assignment. Hallelujah. So each gifting from God 
is a special ability or a special assignment. Will you testify one more time for me, please, to the person next to you? I'm on earth with a special assignment. You got to get that. Uh, you are here. You have been brought to earth on special assignment. And uh, as he has brought you here uh, to this earth on special assignment, has formed you, crafted you, he has given you special ability. And uh, with these abilities, uh, the text shows us uh, there are different types of them. Uh, he has given each gift uh, according to the grace uh, that's been given unto us. Now, here's why I ponder that God gives the gift, and as he gives the gift, each gift in his special assignment has a special ability, but he has given grace to each gift. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. But when you speak in terms of redemption, you can't have grace without having mercy. Whenever grace is shows up, mercy is somewhere around. So it makes me think, why would God give those in his church and give grace to those in his church? He has given each gifting grace so that they could function in ministry. But if we, as we think and we see it, grace doesn't come by itself. Grace comes accompanied with mercy. What's mercy, Pastor? Pa mercy is the love of God. It is the kindness of God that holds back his wrath. Mercy is necessary when someone has erred or someone has sinned. And when sin shows up or when error shows up, now we need mercy to step in and to hold back the wrath that is justly deserved. Think of this now. God gives a gifting, but he gives grace to each gifting. If he's given grace to each gifting, then he knew that each person with uh, this special gift on special assignment, somewhere when they were released in this earth, that they would miss the mark. He knew when he specially crafted you and sent you to this earth and placed you in this era, out of all eras that have, ex have existed in the earth, you couldn't, brothers and sisters, truth be told, we did not choose our day or year to come here. We had no cognizant uh, knowledge of us coming into uh, this earth. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> now, you was moving inside your mother, but you don't remember your birthday. They tell us that our earliest recollections uh, are possibly at three and there are some moments that you might remember uh, at two. But outside of that, what you uh, discovered or, or what you were aware of in your surroundings, initially you don't, you don't know. Always, I'm just going to throw this in. I, I was chasing wild rabbits this morning, and let me just chase one real quickly. Uh, I never really figure out why we throw huge birthday parties for, for one-year-olds uh, when they won't remember it anyway. But that's a whole other story. I'm just saying. You're going to spend uh, hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a baby uh, who will never remember the day, that birthday. Uh, so I think it's more for the adults than it is for the kids. But anyway, I'm just, I'm, no, I'm done. Let me get back to the text because... There's too many temptations out there for me to run after, and I'm going to stick to the text today. All right. Uh, so he, he gives grace to each gifting because he, he knew that somewhere along the way that as a gift from him on special assignment that you would not walk in the gifting that you were sent here for. So he gave you grace. What's grace, Pastor? A loose translation of grace is simply a second chance. Because your sin mandates that you die. How so? The ways of sin is, come on, talk to me. The ways of sin is death. death. So when you sin the first time, uh, God was supposed to kill you. The first time, 
that you sin. Now think about it. Even after you came to salvation, you entered into Christ, the first time that you sinned, God was supposed to kill you. For the wage of sin is death. And the, just in case somebody thinks, well, I'm, no, I ain't better than this person next to me. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So who am I talking to? You. I'm talking to everybody in this, this room from the person who's been saved for 50 years and the person who's been saved for one day. All of us were born in sin and shaped in iniquity and in sin that our mothers conceive us. And if you say you have not sinned, then you are a liar and the truth of God is not in you. All right. So we clear? So, uh, all of us sin, but he gave us grace for the gifting. Let's, let's turn it a little further. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. As he has given gifts in the earth. Corinthians tells us that there are diversities of gifts. There are differences of administration. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same Lord or it is the self-same spirit who gives out or distributes all these different types of giftings that are in the church. What is imperative for us as a body of believers to understand is that God placed each of us in this earth and he made us different from the other person. God never intended for everybody in the church to look alike. Hallelujah. He did not intend for the church, everybody in, in the church to do the same thing the same way. There are different ways of doing things. We just got to make sure that when it's all over with, we have arrived at the same destination. There's more than one way to put on your shoes and socks. There are uh, some people do sock, sock, shoe, shoe. Some people do sock, shoe, sock, shoe. We in trouble if you do shoe, shoe, sock, sock. You get me? And so. There's, there's different paradigms that we can start from, but the end result should be the same. God never intended for uh, all of us to uh, look alike or even to be alike. Uh, if he intended that, we'd all have the same pigmentation of the skin and the same uh, uh, grade of hair. But we're, we're all... Uh, different. Some uh, hair falls out early, some uh, is thick, some uh, uh, is thin, some gray early, some uh, barely gray at all. Some are red, some are brown, and some are made brown. But anyways. Yes, hallelujah. But there are, are differences in all of us. Think of this. Um, for, for the most part, most of us, uh, we shop at department stores. And so uh, we buy mass-produced clothes. Uh, but it's interesting that as we all buy, have bought mass-produced clothes, uh, we all showed up looking different today. And God intended you to be different from the other person. And that's why he gave you a different fingerprint than the other person. And that, that's why uh, your, your mouth print is different from the other person. The way your hair grows is different from everybody else. He made us to be different. What we got to learn uh, is to do is to blend our, our differences together to make one corporate anointing. And how can we do this? Well, uh, Exodus 30 shows us that there are, there, in the anointing oil, there were four principal spices, and uh, uh, it's the last few verses of Exodus 30, four principal spices, but there was one compound that brought all the spices together, and that was the olive oil. The olive oil is symbolic of the spirit. Look back again at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 4. There are differences of gifts, but the same Lord, there are the same spirit. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. What's the point? The point is this, that God makes us all different, but it's the spirit of God that makes us all unified. And so, when we have uh, disagreements between ourselves, then the spirit doesn't disagree. That's the flesh. Amen. 
It's not the spirit that's disagreeing because the spirit is one. The problem that we have uh, is our, our flesh is disagreeing with the other person because we want it one way and they want it another way and each sees that their way appears to be right. Spirit is one. Okay. And so he, he gives us different offers, different administrations. Let's go to the next one. Uh, verse 12, same chapter through 18. Uh, let, me, let me conclude one part of, of the first section. Um, he gives us differences of administration to profit with all. Okay? To profit with all. That word profit uh, indicates it is for the benefit, it is for the advantage uh, of the, or the edification of others. God made you different so that you could benefit the body of Christ. God made you, you different so that you could benefit your family. God made you different so you could benefit society. God made you to be different so you could become uh, beneficial to this entire world. Okay. And so, uh, as Arby says, <clears throat> different is good. All right. Uh, you missed that one. 1 Corinthians 12. With these different arrangements, different giftings that are in the body of Christ, uh, verses 12 through 18 present to us uh, each of us have a different function the eye can't say to the hand I don't need you the mouth can't say to the eye I have no need of you the nose uh, can't say to the foot I, I have no need of you because we are all blended together part of one body there are many members but there's only one body different offices different positions, but it's the same body, the same spirit, it's the same Lord. And uh, Paul tells us that God has set each person in the body as it has pleased him. So, you are where you are because God put you there. Ooh. You are who you are because God made you like that. You're wired the way that you are because God intended for you to be different from other people. What you have become it is a response to your environment. So I have, I received negativity, so I became negative, not because God made me that way. It's just a response to my environment. I, wouldn't, I wasn't born bitter, but I became bitter because of disappointments. But he didn't make me this way. I wasn't born being skeptical of people, but I've been burnt enough that it's hard for me to believe folks. They don't identify with me yet. Not them, all right. And so now I've, be, I've become this way. Not because this is the way God made me. This is now how I've become because this is what I've seen. This is what I've been involved in. This is what I've been uh, immersed into. And, 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 and some things, some things uh, have been indoctrinated into us because our parents and our grandparents had stinking thinking. So their thoughts were messed up and they passed those messed up thoughts down to their kids and they passed those messed up thoughts down to, to you and now you, you're struggling trying to get ahead or get your head up and they, they, you uh, have, have adapted to a cycle of bad behavior. Stay focused. But there are some generational thought patterns. Poor spending habits have been passed on generationally. All about looking good. Oh, Jesus. House busted. Car busted. But you look like a million dollars. Car payments in, in the closet. 
mortgage payment under the bed. That's clothes and shoes. Uh, Y'all stop pulling on me and I, and I won't have to go all these different directions. So we, we passed on uh, distorted thoughts. Men weren't born dogs. They've just been trained to be. So when they bite you, it's what they were trained. making sense to anybody. So he's, he's, he's placed each of us where he has desired. What we've got to learn is, is how to uh, unearth who he wired me to be. I need to uh, figure out my original identity. What was it that he created me to be, and how did he create me to think? So if I can get his mindset on, on uh, these perspectives in life, I'll, I'll be a lot better off. But see, he set each of us in the body as it has pleased him. Um, now let's, let's, let's look at Peter. John chapter 1, verse 40 and 42. Jesus encounters Peter for the first time. His name is called Simon when he meets him. Simon means he who obeys or he who hears. He who obeys or he who hears. Jesus, when he sees uh, Simon, he says, uh, you are Simon, son of John, but I'm going to call you Cephas, or I will call you Peter. What's that? Peter is a small stone from a massive slab or a massive stone. So Jesus was saying, you are one who hears or one who obeys. But I'm going to call you or say that you are a chip off the old block. His, mother's, his mother and his father said, on the day he was born, on the eighth day when he was brought to the synagogue uh, and he was named, they called over him, they, they summoned and said, his name shall be called Simon. He'll be one who hears. He will be one who obeys. But when you read Peter's life, Peter did everything else but hear. <laughs> Peter did everything else but obey. Uh, Peter has uh, a, a rocky start. If you actually, when you see it, when Jesus called Peter, he's down in Jerusalem, and uh, he tells Peter, "Follow me." And just a few days later, Peter winds up in Galilee. <laughs> Jesus called him and said, "Follow me." He's like, "Yeah, Lord, I'm with you." Jesus is moving around. He looks up. Peter's gone. Where is Peter? He's back in Galilee. When Jesus sees Peter again, he's at the Sea of Galilee. What's Peter doing? He's fishing. Jesus says to him again, follow me and I'll make you to be fishers. Man, you'd think that a few days earlier he would have heard the call. So he was excited at revival, <laughs> gave his life to Christ, turned around and backslid, went back home and did what he was doing again, that Jesus had to call him one more time and said, I, didn't I tell you? Follow me. Peter starts hanging out uh, with Jesus, and uh, he's a real interesting character because uh, Peter seemed to know more than Jesus did. Yeah. On several occasions, Peter would, would say to the Lord, no, Lord, that this is not so. Lord, I believe it's 
is, is this way. And Jesus had to keep rebuking him because Peter was a know-it-all. Everything. God had to keep putting him back in his place and show him, no, no, no. You, you don't know like you think you know. Peter had to be rebuked on several occasions because he'd be the first one to speak up, but he would always be the one who'd have the lack of faith. Jesus would perform a miracle. As a matter of fact, you find three times in Scripture where Jesus breaks bread and fish, and each time Peter's amazed at the fact that Jesus was breaking bread and fish as if he had never seen this done before and as if the Lord, and I can understand the first time, but the second time they're hungry and there's fish and bread again. Well, I don't know what we're going to do, what you want us to do, Lord. He said, have you any bread? Have you any meat? Where's your faith at? So he gets bread, brings it to the Lord, he breaks it, these are multitude. Third time. And y'all said third time was a charm. But the third time it happened. <laughs> Here he is. He's having two. The Lord says, the, the, the type of reporting, you know, Lord, uh, we hungry, they hungry. He said, you have any bread, have any meat? That's all we got is this <laughs> bread and fish here. The Lord says, what's wrong with your faith? Bring it here. So he has to take the bread again uh, and the fish, and he breaks it and feeds the multitude. Three times this occurs. There are several occurrences when they're out on the water and the storm breaks out. First time it happens, here's the Lord, and Jesus was on board with them. He's on board with them. And uh, the storm breaks out, and they're crying for their lives, and Peter says, Lord, don't you care we're about to die? Jesus gets up, he rebukes the wind, and he rebukes the storm, he rebukes the sea, everything is, and it comes to a calm. Next time it happens, they're out there by themselves. Jesus was uh, uh, on the mountainside praying. Scripture says that the storm arose in the water, and Jesus just started walking in the middle of the storm. And he walks to the, towards the boat. They're scared for them lie, their lives, and the Scripture indicates they almost jumped overboard because they saw Jesus coming on the water and he he gets in the boat and when he gets in they arrive safely to the shore and Jesus when he gets to the shore he said didn't I t tell you that we're going over to the other side third time it happens here comes storm again Jesus is not in the boat and here comes uh, Jesus walking on the water second time walking on the water third time there was a storm and Peter says Lord is that you? Tell me to come if it's you. Jesus says, uh, come. Peter now, steps out the boat, starts walking towards Jesus. Please understand, the storm was already boisterous. The waves uh, were also boisterous. The boat was almost being broken up. Jesus says, come on, Peter. Peter starts walking on the water in the middle of the storm and then notices, wait a minute, I'm out here, <laughs> and there's nothing underneath me. <laughs> and begin to sink, he cries, Lord, save me. And Jesus, once again, has to rebuke Peter for his, his lack of faith. Uh, Peter was quite, the, quite the, the hard head as well. He was quick to put somebody in, in place, uh, and Peter was a fighter. Fighter. Because when Jesus was about to send him out, he said, listen, now, I called you to preach, but you got to put your weapon away. <laughs> put your weapon away. And uh, so he goes out, and he's preaching and praying for folks, uh, and he uh, doesn't have any weapons for three years. He's carrying no weapon because Jesus told him to put it up. And uh, so Jesus comes to the end of his ministry for three and a half years, and he tells him, now, I told you before, put your, your sword away, but those of you who don't have a sword, go get a sword. And you didn't have any money, go, go get some money now. And uh, the only one that we saw uh, who was trigger happy was Peter. Peter. Because when they came to uh, arrest Jesus, and he, uh, he was quite the swordsman. For when they came to arrest Jesus, he pulls out the sword quickly and he cuts the ear of the servant of the high priest off. And Jesus tells him, now, now if you're going to live by the sword, you're going to 
down by the sword, put that sword up his hand. And he cleans up Peter's mess, heals the man's ear. And Jesus is telling him, I'm going to die. Peter says, no. Lose translation. He's telling Jesus, you better shut up. It will never happen like that. Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. For you aren't concerned about the things of God. You're only concerned about the things of man. He's telling Peter, you're not concerned about anything that I'm concerned about. Your only concern is about yourself. So Peter, outside of being a uh, uh, rebuttal, uh, or, or uh, outside of being a, a know-it-all, and uh, uh, outside of being a, a, a fighter, uh, Peter was also self-centered. Self-centered. And the Lord has to tell him, you're not, you're not concerned about the things I'm concerned about. You're concerned about yourself, Peter. You're, you're only saying this because. If I die, then your thoughts are, I won't get a throne when you come into your kingdom. You have no concern about me. You're only following me, Peter, for what you can get out of it. Hallelujah. Just because you heard, I'm a king, and you figure if I follow the king, I'll sit with the king. So you're only in this, Peter, for yourself. When Jesus says, I'm going to die, Peter says, Lord, I'll die with you. If you die, I'll die. <laughs> We're going down together. She indicates and shows us when they came to arrest Jesus, what did Peter do? He took off. He ran. <laughs> He's hiding. We can't find him. He had a lot of mouth when nobody was around. But when the pressure started mounting, then now we found out that he had some cowardly tendencies. He wasn't willing to stand up like he said he would. So he falls from a distance and he's questioned, aren't you the one? Don't you follow him? The Lord told him that, Peter, before the cock crows or the rooster crows uh, three times, uh, you will deny me one text says one time uh, or the rooster crows twice, uh, but either or, you're going to deny me three times. And the scripture shows us each time he denies the Lord and it went so far as to bring down curses on himself or to say, that if I know Jesus, if I really know who he is, may lightning come from heaven and strike me down right now. Jesus looks at him after the rooster crows and Peter dies and three times. Peter remembers the words of Jesus. He breaks down and starts crying. And you'd think that Peter, after uh, seeing Jesus look at him, remembering that he uh, had denied the Lord, he would come to himself. He would go to a corner, find some place, and start praying for repentance. What does Peter do? He quit. He abandoned ministry. He said, I don't want this anymore. I'm done with this. He goes home. He's locking the windows. He closes the, the doors, locks the doors. And uh, when we find him, he's gone back to his trade that he was doing before Jesus called him. And he went back to being a fisher. Jesus, after he had rose, risen from the dead and he rises from the dead, uh, they tell him that Jesus is risen. He and John run to the tomb, and uh, uh, John outruns him, but Peter goes in first. When he gets there, he looks, finds, doesn't see where Jesus is at all. He goes back home, goes back to his old former lifestyle. The ladies, they hang out. There's a young man who appears in the tomb and begins to tell the people and to tell the women that Jesus, you're looking for him. He's not here. He's risen just like he said, but he said to tell, give you a message. Go and tell his disciples that he's going ahead of you in the Galilee. And uh, he's going there, but tell Peter to show up too. What you're saying? He's saying this. Now, I'm going in the Galilee. Tell my disciples who have testified 
to who I am, I'm going to Galilee. But make sure you give a special invitation to Peter. Why? Because Peter quit the group. Peter gave up on the ministry. Peter has walked away from his call. Peter has denied who he really is. Peter doesn't want anything to do with this the pressure that it goes that goes with, with ministry. But go tell Peter, I want to meet him. Tell Peter that we're, we're, we're going to church, but tell Peter to show up for church too. Tell Peter we're, we're, we're going to simmer once again, and I expect to see him at the meeting. For after all, Peter had divine revelation. Matthew 16, when Jesus asked him, who do men say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. For flesh and blood did not reveal this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He says, so I'll, I'll say also unto thee that thou art Peter, he says. And on this rock, I'll build my church. If you'll see this, he actually gives him the name Peter two times. At the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, he said, I'm going to call you Peter. Uh, you're supposed to listen. You're supposed to obey. But uh, when I'm finished with you, you'll be a, a chip off the old block. When I'm, I'm finished working with you, you'll be a representation of a greater ministry or a greater anointing. Look at this. Peter, Jesus tells him, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you that's sweet. Peter, the devil is after you. And he doesn't want just one part of your life. He, Peter, the devil's looking at every part of who you are. For he is sifting you as wheat. He's looking at, at every kernel of grain. He's looking at, at every particle of wheat. And he is trying to attack every ounce of who you are. Please see this, brothers and sisters. The reason why life seems to be hard for you, why it seems to be difficult for you, is because Jesus has already informed you there's a devil out there and he's trying to sift you as we. He's looking at every aspect of your life. And you think thinking one time you have it together and now this breaks out over here. So it appears as if I can't ever get ahead and why am I always having to fight? Why am I always having to, to hang in there? Satan has desired to sift you. Sweet is sifted. But what did Jesus say? He said, but I, I've prayed. I've already interceded for you. I've already ran interference for you. He's after you. He wants to destroy you. But I've been interceding in your behalf. He's after you. He wants to destroy you. But I've been running interference for you. What have you been praying, Jesus? He said, I prayed that your faith fails not. I prayed that you won't give up. I prayed that you won't throw in the towel. I prayed that you won't walk away from this. I prayed that you won't abandon your ministry. I prayed that you won't abandon your calling. I, I, I prayed that you would learn your true identity. Yes, Walked away from it. I prayed for you that you are Faith fails not. So, as hard as it's been for you, how are you still making it? As, as difficult as it's been, how are you still here? Somebody was praying for you. 
someone was running interference for you. Can I take it a step further in that text? He goes on and says uh, to, to Peter, and when you are converted, strengthen your brother. Peter, after you've been transformed, after you've crossed over, after you've come into who you are, strengthen your brother. What's he saying about Peter? He's telling Peter that the devil's going to sift you. He's going to try you. He's going to come after you. I've been praying for you that you won't give up. But when you are converted, when you're converted, when you cross over, when you are transformed, What's he saying? This crossing over, this transformation indicates, Peter, I knew when I called you, you were going to mess up. I knew when I selected you that you were faulty when I selected you. Peter, I knew you came with drama when I called you. I knew you had issues. To deal with when I called you, but I, I selected you because I know there's something in you. And when you come to yourself, when you understand your your true identity, you'll be a, a benefit to somebody else. Didn't we just see that a second ago that He gives us grace for ministry? And the reason He gives us grace because He already knew that there would be some fault in you. So with grace comes mercy, so he holds back uh, his wrath to so give you a chance to get it together one more time. And he gave you the gifting, gave you a special assignment so that you might be a benefit to other people. So when you are converted, Peter, you'll be able to be a strength or benefit to somebody else. Peter, when you come into who you really are, when your mind is transformed, You'll be of advantage to somebody. We are a body fitly framed together. And by every joint supply. Who am I talking to this morning? You've been struggling in your life. You've walked away. You've said to God, yeah, I know it's the right thing to do is to serve you. But I don't know about this whole working for you. Because it's too much with that. Who am I talking to this morning? Who has? You know the right thing to do is to come to church. But you come, you sing the songs because you know that you owe God praise. But you sing it, but your heart's not there. You're praying, but your heart's not there. You you open the Bible with us, but that's about it. You decline in your spiritual life because uh, it's gotten too hard, but you know better than just to completely abandon God. Because your thoughts are, if I, if I just completely walk away from him, I might just jeopardize and end up in hell. So I, at least I better at least do the right thing and come to church. So I'm just going through motions. Doing it because it's supposed to be done. But not because it's your heart's desire or your love for. Hear God saying, tell Peter, come home. He's been, he's walked away from me. He's been lost in the house but he's still lost. He's singing. He's lifting his hands, but he's still lost. She's, she's showing up the church. She's carrying a Bible. She's singing the songs, but in her heart, she still does it her own way. So she's still lost. Proverbs 14, 14 says, a backslider in heart is filled with his own way. Brothers and sisters, you can still dress apart, 
but your heart still be lost. You can still look. Yeah, there's a certain way to look sanctified. You can still look sanctified. Still be lost. How do you know it? How do you know that you're, you're slipping away? When your desire to listen to his music starts to diminish. How do you know when you're losing it? When you're diminishing in a relationship with him? When you find more excuses not to read his word? How do you know that your relationship with God is diminishing? When you start watching stuff that you know better than to watch. How do you know that your relationship with God is diminishing? When you start entertaining crowds that you walked away from when you got saved. How do you know that your relationship with God is diminishing? When you start saying, well, I can be around them as long as I don't do it. How do you know relationship with God is diminishing when you start saying things like, but what's wrong with it? But what's wrong with it? But what's wrong with it? But what's wrong? He's not going to send me to hell over this. He won't send me to hell over that. He won't send me to hell over that. Your relationship is slowly diminishing, slipping away from him. It won't hurt just this one time. Just this once. As long, as long as I can ask him for forgiveness, I'll be all right. Your relationship is slowly diminishing. Huh. Why'd you show up today? Well, he sent an invitation to you. The Spirit said, you said, I got so many other things to do, and I'm tired. I've had guests over. I got all this mess to clean up in my house from this, this, this weekend and Thanksgiving. My, my kinfolk done tore my house up. I got to work tomorrow. I need to get a jump start on my Christmas list and catch those sales. For the Black Friday sales all over with, I, need, I just get that, that last second in. And somebody this morning, he touched you and said, get up. He said, I don't feel like going to church. He said, come on, get up. Come on, get up. And you, you pushed. You came. You're here. And you didn't know the Spirit sent you an invitation. Because he knew that your soul was fading. And he knew that your spirit was growing weak. So he was trying to give you a heads up. Because he still loves you. And he still wants that oil to flow in, in your life. And he still has a call for you. Even though you've, you've abandoned him. Even though you've been, you have been walking the way you're, you're supposed to. Even though you've denied him. He still has that call for your life. Beckoning you to come. If this message has touched you, if it has found you, if you've heard God through these words that were spoken, and you know, man, he got me this morning. Will you come down to this altar while everybody stands? Just come around the altar. I want to pray with you, pray for you. Just come, just come, just come. Thank you, Jesus. My brother, my sister, come, come. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided To follow Jesus, I have decided 
to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Hear me. You don't have to be doing big sins to be wrong with God. It can just be simple thought that turns into action. It can just be desire in your heart, just desire to want to do. We want to pray with you, pray for you. We want to join together with Jesus' prayer that he already prayed for you. That your faith won't fail. Yes, you're going to be tried. Yes, you're going to be tested. Yes, you're going to be tempted. But he's already prayed for you. He want to join with his prayer. I have decided. I have decided to follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You can have the whole world. You can have this whole world. Just give me have the whole world. This whole world just give me Jesus. You can have this whole world just give me no turning back. No turning back. No turning back. As you hear, you raise those hands of Jesus. <laughs> Father, we come today. We come admitting to you that, that we don't have it like we used to. We come, Lord, ad admitting to you there have been some interpersonal struggles that we've had. There have been some outer struggles that we've had. Lord, we come ad admitting to you we've been challenged on every hand and side. Some of us, Lord, different from the other, but we've all been challenged in one form or another. Lord, that there's some who've openly with their mouth denied you. There's others who have privately in their hearts denied you. There have been those who've walked away from the call, walked away from the, their ministry assignment. There's been those who've walked away from salvation and they said, what, what's the point? What, what's the use when life seems to be so hard, so, so difficult? There are others, Lord, who are on the verge of, of walking away from you, who are on the verge of, of, of giving up. But I pray today, Father, for every individual that, that's here, that, that has come to this altar. God, you have sent your word. God, in this hour, in this time, and what a timely word uh, this is for our day and for our generation. Now, God, these who have come to the altar, they have responded, Lord, to the call. They have heard, God, your word being spoken unto them. They've heard the Spirit uh, saying, telling them to come. Now, God, I pray, let him that has ears begin to respond, begin to, to obey. May they begin to represent you and go forth in their ministry and their calling. Now, Father, I also pray may that each individual, God, God, who has that gift and has that calling, let them be converted, God. Let them be transformed. God, may they have the power in you to overcome every obstacle, every habit, every addiction. Now, by the power and the authority of Jesus,
Jesus. I come against every demonic influence. I come against every strategy of Satan. I come against every habit and every addiction. By the power and the authority of Almighty God, we counsel the assignment of Satan. And Lord, your blood still works. May your blood cleanse our hearts. May your blood cleanse our minds. May your blood, God, renew us today. May your blood, God, remove sin from us. May your blood, hallelujah, give us life today. May your blood today, Jesus, call someone to be resurrected. And Lord, when your blood applied to our life, Take your oil of anointing, hallelujah, and begin to pour it over us. Oh, God, let that oil of anointing, God, flow over every injury, over every disappointment, God. May the oil of anointing, hallelujah to God, begin to heal our hearts and to heal our minds and to heal our lives and to heal our ministries. And by the power and the authority of Almighty God, we command you now, my brother, my sister, to begin to rise up and begin to go forth in the calling, the gifting that Jesus Christ has called you to. Father, I thank you right now for what you're doing in this place. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in these lives. We decree to be so now in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, will you lift those hands?